Hello, my name is Maximilian Doré. I'm a doctoral student in computer science uh, at the University of Oxford, and I would like to talk about my research field, which is about devising a logic for mathematics. When I say logic for mathematics, it's of course not clear what, what I mean by that. So the first thing we'll do is we'll understand what, what logic is all about, what logicians do, and what it means to uh, devise a logic for something. And what we'll see there is logicians are mostly concerned with finding obscurities in our language that can be natural language or mathematical language. And then logicians try to clear up these obscurities and, and pin down what we mean exactly when we say th certain things. Uh, then we'll focus on mathematical language because that's uh, what, what I'm mostly interested in in my research. And there we'll see that already some expressions or some sentences you, you've seen in your math classes have some, some obscurities and are ambiguous. And um, it's, it's worth uh, to think about how we can reconstruct these, these sentences and expressions. Uh, and I hope that uh, with this talk you, you see how logic is still a very active field of research. So it's no, by no means fixed since Aristotle. There's still a lot of uh, very groundbreaking research going on, which is at the intersection of philosophy, computer science and mathematics. So let's see logic in action. Imagine you have a friend, Sam, and you know that uh, she's an avid sock wearer. So whenever she's at home, uh, she'll wear socks. And now you learn she isn't wearing socks. Maybe she's texted you that her, her bare foot got stung by a wasp. So then you infer that she can't be at home, right? Because if she were at home, she would be wearing socks. And indeed, this, this is a sound argument. And uh, we, can, we can understand this by investigating the logical structure of this argument. So in the first sentence, if Sam is at home, then she wears socks, we have two, two sub-sentences. So the first one is that Sam is home, and the second that she wears socks. So the, the logical structure is if A, A stands for Sam is at home, then B, and B stands for she wears socks. And now the next sentence, we say that, in fact, she isn't wearing socks. So we, we say the opposite of what came after then. So we formalize this as not B is the case. And now we make our, our conclusion in our argument. Now we say hence. So we denote this with this line here. That's a logical notation for, for an inference. And then we say the opposite of Sam is home is true. So not A is true. And this logical structure of A then B, not B, hence not A, is in general valid. So whenever we see an argument of this form, we know it's, it's true. Now let's look at, at a different example. So we still talk about Sam, and we know that she, she will be wearing socks at home. And now we learn that Sam isn't at home. Maybe she just sent a picture from, from the ice cream shop. And now we might infer, okay, there's some relation between Sam being at home and Sam wearing socks. So if she isn't at home, then she, she can't wear socks. But that doesn't sound quite right, right? Because we didn't say that she won't wear socks when she's not at home. We, we don't know about that. I mean, if she's wearing shoes, she will certainly want to wear socks as well. So this is not a valid argument. And we can, again, reconstruct this. So again, we have this form if A then B. And then we establish that not A is the case, that Sam is not at home. And then the inference, so this, this conclusion line indicates that, in fact, it doesn't hold that, that B is not, not the case in general. So we don't know anything about her wearing socks or not. We just know that if, she, if Sam is home, then she won't wear socks. So this is uh, one example of how, how logicians try to find patterns in, in our language, in this case, in our natural language, so language that we use in everyday life. Uh, what I'm interested in is not, not natural language, but uh, mathematical language, and in particular, identity statements in mathematics. So when I say identity or equality, I don't mean this in a political sense. Uh, it's just in, in the sense of, of mathematical statements, such as the following. So for instance, you might see that two plus two equals four. That's that's an equality statement. Uh, and some other sentence you have seen maybe is x squared plus three equals seven. So here we have a variable x inside, and we were wondering 
can we can we put something in for the x that makes this equality statement true and now if we if we look at the truth of these statements we have a difference here because 2 plus 2 equal 4 that's a pretty obvious statement right we we can hardly prove that it's just that two apples and two apples make four apples uh, well, the second kind of, of equality statement we actually need to to do more work uh, because it's not at all obvious that this is a true statement only when we can solve this equation so when we find some x that makes the statement true then we know it's true so if we put in 2 for x then we know that 2 squared plus 3 is indeed 7 so only by giving this proof we make this statement true so it seems like there are two kinds of equalities in, in mathematics. So already by looking at these, these two simple sentences, we can see there's some difference in, in what we mean when we establish a, an equality and what we need to do to, to prove that some equality holds. Let's look more closely at this first kind of equality, which we said was obvious. So what we'll do now is we'll devise a method that can tell us if such a statement is, is true or not true. Um, just by following some simple rules without any ingenuity. So we'll need some ingenuity to devise the rules, but once we have them, a computer can follow them uh, without any, any ambiguity. So the first thing we need is we need a representation for numbers. Um, how, how can we formalize all, all the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth? And the basic idea is we'll just say that 0 is a number that, that we know, and then the successor of a number will also be a number. So for instance, one is just represented as the successor of zero, and we'll write this as sac of zero. And given this representation for, for numbers, we can now talk about addition. And for that, we'll introduce two rules. So we have two, two lines with two different rules that we follow, depending on whether the first thing we, we put in our addition is zero, or the successor of some number. So for instance, when we calculate 0 plus 1, we just have to follow the first rule, because the first number we gave is 0, and the second number we gave is 1. So that's our m here, the successor of 0. And 0 plus anything will just be this, the second number that we gave. So we just know 0 plus 1 is equal to 1 by following this first rule. To calculate the other uh, kind of equality that we can have with 1 plus 0, so note that the order really matters here, uh, we have to employ the second rule, because now the first number we put in is not 0, but the success of something, namely the successor of 0. So our n is 0 in this case, and m, the second number we put in, is also 0. And this rule now works as follows. On the left-hand side, we have the successor of some number plus some other number, is equal to the successor of both of these numbers combined. So we shift the scope of the successor symbol here from left to right. On the left-hand side, it's only around n. And on the right-hand side, it's around n plus m. And this idea allows us to kind of shrink the size of, of n in each step. So we know that 1 plus 0 is just the successor of 0 plus 0. And 0 plus 0 is just 0 by the first rule. So we know 1 plus 0 is is one as well. So now uh, I invite you to try to calculate 2 plus 2 equals 4 just by following these rules. So if you want to do that, just pause the video. Alright, I hope you were successful in, in doing this calculation. Let's do this as well. So 2 plus 2 will be represented in our representation just as the successor of the successor of 0 plus the successor of the successor of 0. So now on the left-hand side we have something greater than 0, so we'll have to apply the second rule. Our n will be successor of 0, and our m will be successor of successor of 0. So we know this is just equal to the successor, and now we have 1 plus 2 inside. So our n in the next step will be 0 and our m will be 2. So now we again can put one successor symbol outside of our addition. So now we have successor of successor of 0 plus 2. And now uh, we finally unfolded 
the addition enough to apply the first rule because now we have zero plus something and by the first rule we know this is just this secondly given something. So total 2 plus 2 will be equal to the successor of the successor of the successor of the successor of 0, which is just standing for 4. So this is a method that any computer can follow. And actually, a computer can do that way faster than, than we, because we're not that good as, at computations. All right, so we've established that the other kind of equalities is quite obvious. We said that this equality x squared plus 3 equals 7, which looks more, more complicated, is not evident at all. So there, to, to show that such an equality statement is true, we have to give a proof. Because the statement really means there is an x such that something holds, and to prove such a statement, we, we would expect to give such an x, right? Now, uh, we can in analyze this even further, because we not only have one number 2, which makes the statement true, but also we could put in minus 2 to make this equality hold. Because minus 2 squared, as you know, is also 4 plus 4, because minus times minus is plus. So we have 4 plus 3 equals 7 being still true. So we in fact have two proofs of this of the statement. And since numbers are considered objects in mathematical language because they are just the fundamental building blocks of, of mathematics, such as some, some other objects that we'll, we'll see soon. We can talk of 2 and minus 2 in this context as being proof objects, because on the one hand they prove the statement, and on the other hand they are really mathematical objects, so these kinds of entities that mathematicians are interested in. And this idea of proofs being mathematical objects is very, very crucial, as we'll see in the following, because that allows us to, to also investigate these proof objects more closely. For the natural numbers, so for, for this case, there isn't much interesting uh, going on, because 2 and minus 2 are just two different numbers. But in a, in a different field, this, these different relations between proof objects is very, very crucial. And that's the mathematical field of topology, which is concerned with studying spaces. In this context, space is really something you, you know from everyday life, so something like a coffee mug or a donut. And then mathematicians try to devise a theory about these spaces and abstract away from, from things like the color or the size of, of a coffee mug and get by at the fundamental properties of such a shape. One fundamental result in topology is that the coffee mug and the donut can actually be considered the same object. because now see in this animation how both objects can be transformed into each other. So given the coffee mug, we can kind of push up the bottom of the cup and then shrink down the cup and enlarge the handle. And that way we get a donut. So there is some transformation between two, the two objects that is continuous and that means if you sit down with clay or play-doh, you could really do this transformation by just pushing out some things, but without tearing the, the clay apart in any way, or without ripping any holes. So this means in topology, the coffee mug and the donut are actually considered the same object. So we describe this one transformation that makes a donut from a coffee mug. I'll just write an equal sign between the two objects. And now, that was a bit arbitrary, the way we transformed the coffee mug, right? We could have also done the transformation maybe in, in different order. So first enlarge the, the handle before pushing up the bottom of the, of the coffee mug. So we could have a different transformation that identifies the two objects. So similarly to how we had 2 and minus 2 being two different proof objects for, for the equation, we now also have two different proof objects that equate these two two elements. And now what's what's very interesting that in topology it's also meaningful to then talk about equality between these proof objects. So we might have two transformations that show the equality of both, both objects, but these might also themselves be equal in some higher sense. So these might be the same transformation just in a different order. So we again have a proof object between these proof objects. And similarly, we could have another proof object between these proof objects. 
And you see how, how this can continue because now we can also investigate identity between the identity between the identities. And this can go on to infinity. And if you're confused now, I guess that's a good sign because understanding this infinite tower of equalities uh, was something that was really subject to a lot of mathematical research in the past decades because many people tried to understand the structure better and we're still not quite at a point where we, we have some fixed definition as to what it means to have this infinite tower of, of equalities. Uh, so there's a lot of research going in capturing precisely how, how we can work this, with this. What's very interesting, this structure was, was known in topology, but also logicians uh, had built in this structure in their, in their theory without even knowing about it. So that's particularly what, what I'm interested in because I'm, I'm a computer scientist and the language of homotopy type theory uh, has a very close connection both to logic and to topology. So this homotopy type theory goes back to the work of a Swedish logician called Per Martin Löw. Already 50 years ago, he devised some, some theory which is called intuitionistic type theory. And there he was just talking about equality statements in the sense that we've seen uh, before. So some, some simple and some more advanced equality statements, but he didn't have in mind uh, topology at all. But then in 2006 and the following years, some researchers noticed that in fact this infinity structure is already built in in the theory in some sense uh, that Per Martin Löw devised, which even he didn't know about. And this uh, insight has sparked a lot of interest and a lot of research ever since. And what's, what's particularly interesting that this language that Per Martin Löw devised can also serve as a programming language. This is a connection which is also very deep, which we didn't have time to talk about. But this means that we can do mathematics in this language, but at the same time, we can run our proofs then on a computer. And one main goal of, of the field of homotopy type theory is now to develop all of mathematics and check if it's correct uh, with a computer and thereby giving mathematicians peace of mind that their, their work is indeed correct. So we've seen in this talk that in mathematics, but also more generally in every kind of language, the devil really lies in the detail and ambiguities and obscurities occur everywhere in our language. And to understand this, we have to be very meticulous and reconstruct on a very fundamental level what we mean by, by certain things. And I think that log logic can really help us in this way to better understand puzzles in natural language and in mathematical language. And I think what you've also seen is that logic is not some monolith which is already fixed. There's a lot of groundbreaking research still going on and it's in particular interesting that it connects different subfields and bigger fields of mathematics which don't seem that connected on first sight, such as computer science, philosophy and mathematics.